Günaydın. Ee, Maruf'un ikinci sabahına hoş geldiniz. Sabahına hoş geldiniz. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of Maruf and we are uh, limited in time so I would like to start quickly. This will be uh, this session will be about the households because as you know the one of the most critical point uh, for the pandemic uh, what we can say the center of pandemic was homes because we all had to stay in our homes we worked at our homes and we socialized in our homes even though we are not uh, realizing the impacts uh, currently we might have eventually transformed the concept of home and I would like to talk about the home in uh, from different perspectives from uh, perspectives of uh, the pandemic and humanity we have a lot of experts uh, in our panels I would like to uh, be quick about this and uh, introduce them our decimates from Lowe University is with us Trading houses in the uh, mobile house uh, is going to be uh, uh, the subject of his uh, production. From uh, Metu, Burcu Özdemir Sarı is with us, and he's uh, she's going to talk about the trends in the markets of household markets. From Istanbul Culture University. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, the design strategies for uh, COVID and home. And uh, from Living Cities, Stockholm, Mats uh, Jarnhammer is with us, and he's going to talk about the neighborhoods, and he's going to talk about the relationship between the household and the neighborhoods. And uh, right now, Robin Richard is not with us currently. He is going to join us uh, if possible. And he's going to talk about sharing uh, households and sharing of the environment. Now, to be quick after, uh, and be efficient with our times, so I would like to immediately start with our rally. And throughout the session, I would be speaking very little to uh, be efficient with our times and uh, so that we can have enough time for Q&A at the end of the session. Thank you very much, uh, Aureli, or uh, the stage is yours right now. So thank you for having me today. Uh, my presentation will consist of um, three main parts. Before specifically going into the Solidary Mobile Housing Project and presenting that to you, I will briefly set the context for the presentation. And then in the last part, I will conclude by making some reflections on the future based on our project and the subject of the conference. So first, a few words on the context, the focus and the aims of my presentation. Geographically, I'm going to focus mainly on the Brussels capital region, as this is where the Solidary Mobile Housing Project is taking place. As you might know, like many other cities around the world, the Brussels capital region is currently facing an acute shortage in affordable housing. Currently, there are more than 44,000 families on the waiting list for social housing which means that less than the half of the demand is met. Moreover, homelessness is also on the rise. Over the past 10 years, the number of people living in a precarious housing situation has more than doubled. At present, there is an estimate of around 3,000 people living on the streets in the Brussels capital region. At the same time, we are noticing that the region is also, like many other cities, faced with a number of urban waiting spaces. These are large or small-scale public or private sites which have been abandoned by a previous user or user and for which either a future function still has to be determined or for which the implementation of a defined future function is being delayed, for example, due to lengthy planning processes, uh, the need for sanitation on neighborhood protests against the future planning. So putting these two together, the central question of our Solidary Mobile Housing Project was, can we develop, test and refine a resilient model and prototype for the co-creation of solidary mobile housing for the houseless on temporary vacant sites in the Brussels capital region. So what I want to specify first is that the project started well before the COVID-19 crisis started. As you can see on this timeline, we were actually in between 
um, co-creating the first prototype and getting a proof of concept for our model when Belgium and the rest of Europe was hit by the sanitary crisis. However, what we noticed at that point is that, as you know or can imagine, the pandemic hit the group of people we were working with really hard. On the 3rd of March 2020, the Belgian Minister of Health, Marie de Bloch, stated quite bluntly on national television, Blijf in uw kot, ik meen het, basically meaning stay at home, I mean it. But this had some serious consequences. First of all, for the people living on the streets, which were suddenly chased around town by the police, because due to the confinement, they were not supposed to be outside, but they had no home to stay in, and no one wanted them in their neighborhood. Also, due to the curfew at night, they were forced to stay at shelters, but not all of them feel safe to do so, as there is always a risk that they might become the victim of aggression or theft. Moreover, due to overcrowding, there were difficulties to upkeep the social distancing at these shelters. And finally, also a lot of supporting amenities for homeless people, like restaurants and day centers, had to close their doors because of the lockdown. All this resulted in a huge increase in isolation for this target group, amongst others, as cafes and bars were closing and it wasn't even allowed to meet and sit on benches in the public space. Some of these people were deprived of all social contacts, and their already fragile social network crumbled. Already, I, I but of just course, for a second. Uh, the effect of the crisis was not already. only felt by the people living on the street. Also, the more invisible group of houseless people, those who live in very precarious housing conditions, were hit much harder than some of some others. For example, youngsters who fled their home and are... Can you wait one second? Uh, he's trying to reach you. There's a warning. Can you speak up, please? The technical team is asking you to speak up. Thank you. So youngsters who fled their home um, and usually are staying with one and then with another friend, they are now suddenly not allowed to go from one bubble to the other. And families living in overcrowded apartments sometimes had to deal with domestic violence or abuse. And children who are, for example, reliant on school meals to get at least one decent meal a day were suddenly deprived of this as the schools had to close. So in the light of these circumstances, in my presentation, I would mainly like to focus on what could be learned from our project to help to answer the following questions. How to ensure quality housing for all and how can the housing system become more inclusive and more resilient? So let me now present the Solidary Mobile Housing Project to you in more detail. First, I want to introduce you to the project partners. As you can see on this slide, at the heart of the project, there are eight future inhabitants. They are the direct users. They are houseless people who have lost grip on their housing track. Immediately surrounding them and supporting them are employees of the NGOs Centrum voor Algemeen Welzijnswerk and Samen Living Zobau Brussel, focusing on individual and group guidance and neighborhood integration. And also teachers, students and researchers, as myself, from the Faculty of Architecture of KU Leuven, and also my promoter Burak Pak and Yves Schoenjans are part of this, who are responsible for the co-design. Surrounding those are more operational actors like the architectural and construction firms involved in the design and construction of our prototype and uh, as well as more remotely involved actors like the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, organizations and inhabitants and also the local and sublocal authorities. Together, these partners are planning, designing, realizing and testing the Solidary Mobile Housing mo model and prototype. We're doing this in a living lab environment. This is happening up until now through four big participatory action research cycles, the co-planning, the co-design, the co-construction, and currently ongoing co-futuring phases. In each of these cycles, several participatory workshops or events are being organized to bring the different stakeholders together and collectively construct knowledge. These took the form of, for example, study trips and site visits, a design studio, construction and other workshops, and brainstorming and evaluation sessions. The hypothesis behind our approach is that by collectively taking part in every step of the conceptualization, construction, and later also the exploitation of their own houses, homeless people would be empowered 
not only to participate in the co-creation of their own individual house, but also to gradually create a solidary living community in interaction with the surrounding neighborhood. And that through this, they will be able to regain a grip not only on their own housing situation, but also on their whole life. As a result of the project, we thus co-created the Solidary Mobile Housing Model, which on the one hand is incorporating a co-creation method involving social guidance processes, skill building, neighborhood integration and university methods, collaboration, sorry, methods, a financial balance sheet for the prototype and preliminary strategies for operation in the existing legal framework and integration in the current planning and governance codes of the Brussels capital region. On the other hand, the model also includes an empowering design solution and technologies embodied in a design prototype, which is consisting of modular building elements, namely two types of basic modules on trailers, one multifunctional and one technical, four types of facade panels and internal wall panels. These can be combined to generate an almost endless amount of open plan layouts. As such, empowering the users to make and remake their own homes, not only during the design process, but also after the completion of the project. On this slide, you can see the plan for the pilot project configuration, which is currently being installed on an urban waiting space in Brussels in the municipality of Jette. As you can see, this built prototype consists of eight individual housing units and a collective space. The aim of the collective space is on the one hand to facilitate communal life and mutual solidarity within the group. And on the other hand, this space will also serve to organize activities and encouraging encounter and interaction between the inhabitants and other people, like for example, neighborhood residents. The outdoor space surrounding the individual units and collective space is currently also being co-designed with the inhabitants as a semi-public landscape. Here you can see some pictures of the prototype under construction and of some of the other constructions you already realized on the site. Now, as promised in this last part of my presentation, I would like to briefly reflect on what could be learned from our project in the light of making the housing system more inclusive and more resilient. And reflecting on our project, we believe that the central aspect of this is that in the solidary mobile housing model, housing is treated as a verb. Now, this notion of housing as a verb was coined by Turner and Fischer, who were amongst the first researchers to emphasize the importance of putting the decision-making power in the context of housing back into the hands of the users themselves, making a distinction between what things can do in people's life and what they are materially speaking. And thus between housing as a verb, the process or activity of housing, and housing as a noun, which is currently unfortunately the dominant notion, but in which housing is treated as a commodity or product, leading to what is called the financialization of housing. And this is ultimately driving the real estate prices up to the point that housing is becoming unaffordable for low, but even for middle class income people. So what I want to explore in this last section is how the notion of housing as a verb is apparent in the solidary mobile housing model. And we believe that this is happening mainly in four different ways. First, in the project, we are developing a far-reaching co-design and co-creation process, which is focused on empowering all the stakeholders by actively and interactively involving them from the start. In this context, the participatory workshops and events required a critical rethinking of all the involved disciplines and a staging of reorganized relationships to involve not only the researcher and the end users in the research and design activities, but also several practitioners from architectural, construction and social sector, and some scientific experts, um, municipality employees, students and teachers. This allowed all the co-creators to engage in a reflective learning experience, as a result of which we believe real innovation was possible. Secondly, Throughout the project, we of course also developed this innovative type of housing for the most vulnerable users. On the one hand, we believe that on the short term, this can help to repair and modernize the Brussels Capital Regional housing system by developing a method for rapid emergency housing production and by broadening the range of housing typologies and testing out new approaches for the help and guidance of vulnerable people. But on the long term, we also believe this could help to really transform the housing system by allowing a variety of actors, including the end user, to participate not only in the design process, but also through the design product. 
as does rethinking architecture itself as a tool for participation by approaching it as an ever-changing, incomplete and open infrastructure that can empower end users to make and remake their own living environment at any point in time based on their own needs. Thirdly, through the project, we also aimed at reactivating an urban waiting space and interaction with the environment. We believe that this on one hand can allow all residents to help make the city together, which is one of the aims of the Brussels Capital Region's Sustainable Development Plan. Moreover, we also believe this can play a role in the creation and the strengthening of small-scale solidarity networks. In this context, we are already reflecting on what we will be leaving behind when the Solidary Mobile Housing Project moves out. How can our temporary occupation help to prepare a new future for the site and the neighborhood from a bottom-up perspective? And then finally, the aim of the project is also to put the involvement of vulnerable people on the agenda, especially within the discussion on temporary use of urban waiting spaces. In this context, we clearly noticed how the participatory action research process opened up what Chemis and McTaggart are calling communicative space, not only between all the project stakeholders, but also with outsiders, allowing the right to the city to be claimed. Now, as my time is running out, I want to end by pointing out that there are, of course, still many challenges. And maybe this is what we need to discuss with you, because although we are convinced that the Solidarity Mobile Housing model does have many interesting opportunities to offer, it is clear that at this point, it is still a prototype, which needs to further be developed and scaled up. In no way we want to claim that our model will be able to solve the affordable housing crisis in itself. It's not a magic solution, unfortunately. And we are well aware also of the danger of um, temporary solutions being used as a replacement for the government's structural responsibilities. Moreover, Paidakaki and Mullard are pointing out that transformational change triggered by micro-initiatives in the name and on the basis of solidarity goes beyond the establishment of new collaborations between organizations and sectors. And that solidarity-inspired, socially innovative actions cannot take place in a vacuum, but need to be embedded in a bottom-linked governance structure. So this is what, uh, by this they mean that creative strategies need to be developed, which are neither strictly bottom-up nor top-down in which there is a positive interplay across governance levels between public institutional initiatives from above and active and empowering involvement from below. To further develop and create these links is, I think, our main challenge for the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Aureli. Now, uh, let's take uh, notes for our questions, and we will ask our questions at the end of the session. And uh, currently, we have reached 15 minutes. I would like to continue the discussion at the end of the session. Now, uh, to be efficient with time, I'm going to continue with uh, Mysteria currently. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second session uh, to all of our participants. Uh, I'm going to talk about the project that we have done uh, in Tübitak and I will be presenting in Turkish. Uh, hopefully uh, you all uh, are understanding my position and I'm going to share my screen right now. During the COVID, uh, Tubitak has uh, asked for uh, new projects up for uh, solutions for the home problems, and we are also uh, started a project on this uh, manner about uh, the house design and from research to design strategies. Now, for the project strategies, the household's current situation and the future is what we focused on and the design strategies are what we so focused on if uh, anybody would like to get um, more detailed information you can use this web uh, website to get more informations you can check out on the web if I were to quickly talk about it as I've said our research is about 
the physical and uh, psychosocial changes in the household uh, because of the pandemic? How did it change our social life? How uh, did we have to have our social life in our home? And uh, increase of the hygiene requirements, how did it affect uh, our household? And how, what if, if will there be a change in the future for our households because of these changes? Now, for the literature search, uh, we search the social media about uh, how people are talking about these issues. Because, of course, social media has been a lot more active during the pandemic, and then we will we have so focused on Istanbul municipality and uh, the local municipalities in Istanbul. We have made a survey and. We have asked what they have done in their houses and how their psychology has been affected, how the systems in their houses uh, have been affected, how remote working have affected their lives. And uh, after that, with our participants, we have uh, also made interviews with our participants and we wanted to go more into detail about the data that we couldn't get from the survey and we have also wanted to ask their their expectations from the future and we analyzed the survey with SPSS and after analyzing with the coding techniques we have uh, achieved some data that we can use to guide our research and we realized that privacy is very important and to be able to achieve better privacy we realized that we need newer and better constructions for people's personal privacy and also we realized that people can uh, have their uh, psychosocial needs and they, they can if they are able to have enough space and physical activity in their homes they are actually able to achieve their uh, psychosocial needs and our participants during uh, the pandemic have lowered the amount of uh, stuff and furniture in their uh, homes and they have been focusing on more functional houses and they have uh, tried to reach a more minimalistic design and people have said <coughs> that the remote working is not as efficient as uh, regular working and even though they believe that they are thinking that this is going to be a uh, staying and even though companies or even the uh, workers are not thinking about this remote working situation as an efficient manner, they, everybody is thinking that this will continue to be the case. And uh, everybody is also uh, saying that the social life cannot be had in, in, uh, indoors. And uh, they are realizing that the households uh, have some public um, context and even though they do not prefer to have it, they need some constructions to have <clears throat> newer social uh, areas like balconies or uh, rooftops are preferred and people prefer to have more open spaces in their uh, living areas and as a space when we take a look at the space especially the living room has a lot more uh, public space uh, identity and all the public space requirements of the household uh, inhabitants are uh, done in the living room and we realize that these uh, spaces are using uh, used as public spaces for the people and a lot of people use the kitchens for to work at home and they think they love using their kitchens to work at and they love the, having their kitchens uh, as a functional area. Our uh, participants in our survey were uh, most prominently women. 
So this might have an effect uh, on that uh, data point. And the second point uh, that uh, the most used in the f pandemic for remote working and education has been the bedrooms. Of course, the bedroom is better for privacy, but there also have to be social spaces where we uh, work and uh, educate ourselves. And children's rooms, usually the problems with children's rooms has been uh, achieving concentration for children. And they were uh, needing some systems that were uh, helping children achieve their concentrations. Of course, with the pandemic, the uh, value of the wet spaces have been increased. People prefer to have two bathrooms right now, and uh, they prefer to have furniture that are easier to clean. And there's also another uh, change during the pandemic is uh, control of the voice and sound volumes because everybody is constantly at home the light <coughs> levels and sound levels are very important the light levels of the house is very effect uh, have a big impact on uh, people's psychologies and also for neighborhood relationships uh, the sound levels are uh, very uh, impactful and the relationship between uh, inhabitants in the same area, uh, people who do not uh, experience this uh, sound problem actually are happy uh, with their neighbors. And the biggest problem that uh, people experience were rooted in uh, the sound problem. So what have we done with these data, with our research team? We have uh, created three phase uh, workshops and we have uh, turned them into Tesserim uh, design strategy applications and we have also talked about these for interior design uh, university classes. Why did we chose these uh, classes? Because I am uh, the project runner and I have also another friend uh, that is also working at the project. We both had uh, these classes, so we used our own classes. How did uh, space uh, body uh, interaction has changed in the COVID-19 pandemic? And also during the COVID-19 pandemic, how can we make our spaces more livable? In the master's degree right now in the interior design, we, we would like to talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic add to uh, the household design and we taken this as a more active process and we have made our <coughs> workshops and we have we wanted to revise our findings with the purposes of uh, the workshops and realizing the some strategies and improving our designs and using these uh, Designs as a strategy for design, and we were a crowded team. We have a lot of uh, participants, two runners, and we had four uh, applicants, and uh, we had a lot of uh, participants. And after this workshop, the images and uh, that we have created for our strategies has been turned into a, a catalog and you can achieve uh, you can see that catalog in uh, the link in the screen so what kind of products have we designed well, I have a couple of uh, examples and one of the most important uh, ones was making the walls of the house in a more greener uh, manner or having some imagery for greenery so that it seems it's uh, more outdoor like having more compact furniture and also for 
in the moment uh, that we have to lower our interaction with the family members, we better uh, prefer to use smaller furniture. Also, sports and exercise at home is very important. That's why for the tables or TV units uh, or other similar household objects uh, uh, were what we focused on and we tried to generate some areas and spaces that they can use uh, in their exercise time and we have also tried to create some personal cubes to create some privacy areas in the households also entrances of the house uh, is very important the products and people coming from outside you uh, five minutes left for you all right uh, all right and for adaptation at the entrances uh, having some adapting or uh, different step-by-step -step entrance having some uh, <coughs> panels and having some dividers in that area and for the lighting there's another design uh, that we have having some more auto control for lighting how can we allow work from home from the kitchen another design strategy was houses without walls it provides uh, an infrastructure without walls and then the user would take the wall panels and organize their own spaces and in terms of the personal space uh, the furniture is uh, needed to be transformed what kind of furniture could we use or in volumetric terms, uh, we can have uh, like suspended uh, stories and we had zoning um, suggestions for children uh, that they would not be disconnected from their games and uh, when they go into classes, you know, they would be focused on classes. So zoning was based on that. And with hygiene, uh, there's, there was an increasing water consumption and uh, we wanted to uh, use the rainwater it was basically a retrofitting uh, understanding uh, it could be uh, implemented on the existing houses So what is at the basis of this design strategy? You know, creating a balcony uh, or terrace for every uh, house, every unit is not possible. So we can have uh, balcony designs that could be added uh, or we can have systems uh, of uh, uh, terraces that could be added later, that could be retrofitted basically. Uh, we can also create systemic interventions that would increase the loyalty uh, to the unit, to the house. Rather than um, home furniture, we can basically uh, see in the coming future, we can have more public furniture in homes. And uh, we, we should have furnitures that promotes uh, and facilitates sharing and we can create uh, uh, clean and dirty thresholds and the automation systems are going to be uh, more important uh, in terms of noise control and lighting so the automation systems are going to be more uh, important in the houses so what are the outcomes of this uh, design strategy the user does not just want to buy furniture or have decoration, uh, so they want to have more serious interventions. So rather than fully completed um, 
housing, uh, we can have less than um, complete housing uh, provided to the user. And other than systemic intervention, uh, uh, after the systemic intervention, uh, the loyalty to the house is going to increase. And with the automation system, the whole house could be controlled. And this is why uh, we believe uh, the housing designs that are open to IT uh, is going to come to the fore. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I'd like to thank Marif team for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you for this beautiful and informative speech. I have a lot of questions on my mind. I'm going to keep them to the end. But now I'd like to give the floor in brief in uh, to, to Professor Burju. We listened to design solutions for those who stayed home. Uh, we're going to have a look uh, into the systemic dimension of the transformation uh, that we have been going through. And we're going to talk about uh, the effect of this transformation on economy. reaching housing and its changing role in society and housing-based inequalities. In this direction, my presentation today will be about trends in housing markets during the COVID-19 pandemic. And my particular focus uh, will be on the empirical evidence uh, from the Turkish case. Uh, to discuss what will happen in the future in our housing areas, I believe it is necessary first to understand the dynamics of the consumption and production side of the housing markets. So as we all know, um, COVID-19 has changed everything and uh, the meaning of home in our minds and housing preferences in society have also changed. And we were already aware that housing is an indispensable pillar for the well-being of society. Uh, but the pandemic has shown us once again that uh, a decent and affordable home is very significant. Access to open and green spaces in housing areas uh, has a critical role and housing has a role uh, in the economy. So the first two decades of the 21st century have witnessed economic crises, disasters, international migration and the pandemic. I believe it is now a correct time to rethink the role and meaning of housing for society and economy. In this process, housing policies uh, have been transformed, but also the functions and meaning of housing change. Apart from its most basic function of being a shelter, in today's world, housing has many other functions, like it contributes to the economy as a sector, it affects economic activity, it determines mobility dynamics in the labor market. It has a role in human cap capital formation, and it affects the life chances of new generations. Also, it shapes the consumption and investment behavior of society. Tra it, it also transfers the architectural and aesthetic features of the past to the present. And now, uh, with the spread of COVID-19, it has become an essential health determinant and its function as a work, workplace has become more critical than ever. Uh, so uh, let's see what happened uh, during the pandemic on the consumption and uh, production side of the markets uh, using Turkish case as a case study. We know that during the pandemic, housing preferences of households have changed in favor of additional dwelling space uh, to accommodate the needs for work-related needs, uh, availability of outdoor spaces, gardens and balconies for relaxation, and also locations such as low dense housing areas, summer houses in coastal areas, they all become preferable for households. However, we know that uh, not all households were able to fulfill their preferences or aspirations. So, uh, we will we will now using Turkish case uh, investigate what happened 
uh, for different income groups in terms of these features. Here you see in the table information regarding dwelling size, which compares 2019 and 2020. You will see that there are no radical changes between uh, 2019 and 2020 figures. But from the table, you can observe that uh, lowest income uh, households or lowest end of the income bracket consume slightly less dwelling space uh, and they are living in more crowded conditions compared to other household categories. So whenever we check uh, how do they perceive their living conditions, income and living conditions survey of uh, Turkish statistic institutes uh, gives us possibilities to investigate these questions. As we can expect, the households living with low income levels suffer more from the shortage of space. Uh, however, the pandemic increased the space shortage experienced by other income categories. Uh, so this is interesting. Uh, during the pandemic, lowest end of the income bracket uh, display slightly less uh, or report slightly less shortage in their dwelling units. This may be because they were already working on site and their jobs uh, probably uh, were not possible to do uh, in remote conditions. So whenever we check the mobility figures, uh, what about mobility trends? We see that normally highest and high income households uh, were relatively more mobile. And this was also a valid trend during the pandemic. Um, but we see that pandemic has negatively affected the mobility trends in lowest and medium income quintiles. So how did these space requirements and mobility trends affect the housing market in terms of prices and choices? So this is interesting. Uh, you see here uh, on the right hand side, the upper figure reflects flats and the lower figure reflects single family homes. Uh, so in the last two years, we observed 60% increase in prices for flats and 120% increase in prices for single family homes. So before the pandemic, almost 70% of all urban households in Turkey were living in uh, blocks of flats. So uh, apartment type of living uh, is dominant in Turkey, but now there's an increased demand for single family homes. Uh, but considering the high prices and high price increases, apparently entered home ownership is reserved for relatively high income families. On the rental side of the market, increase in rents in the last two years is 35% for flats and 47% for single family homes. So neither the home ownership market nor the rental market is accessible for some segments of the society. So we can say that pandemic also increased housing-based inequalities. There are also figures about housing expenditures. Again, on the consumption side, housing expenditure of households are also affected. Uh, the increase in time spent at home during lockdowns and remote working conditions resulted in rising renovation and repair maintenance expenses. Uh, and also housing expenditures rise. Uh, but of course, uh, people also experience unemployment and loss of income, which created problems in uh, paying rents and housing expenditures. So here you see figures related to uh, the ratio of housing expenditure to household income. Uh, this is this high ratios are problems for almost all income categories, uh, except for highest income households. As you can see in the graph, housing expenditure is uh, a real burden for uh, lowest end of the income bracket. Uh, so as of 2020, households in the lowest income category devote more than 60% of their budget to housing expenditures. So how they perceive uh, these expenditures, this cost burden, as we can expect, um, low stand of the income bracket 
perceive this uh, more as a heavy burden. Of course, other income quintiles also report that housing expenditures are heavy cost burden. But of course, housing cost burden is not uh, only due to the increasing housing expenditure, but it is also related with the loss of income. Uh, during this period, uh, unemployment also has risen, a number of uh, poor people increased with the economic crisis and COVID-19. And as of 2020, 22% of the population in the country is considered at risk of poverty. So what happens on the production side? We know that housing supply is slow uh, uh, to respond changes happening in the demand side. So it cannot easily adapt and construction activity takes some time. Uh, apart from this, 2018 was the year of an economic downturn in Turkey, and it, it had also effects on uh, uh, 2019. So the economic downturn and the following, following COVID-19 pandemic had several adverse effects on the housing sector. On the housing sector, um, let's see what happened, uh, particularly Turkey is known uh, as a high performing market for housing output, uh, but during uh, the economic crisis time and during the COVID-19, the housing output has declined a little bit. Uh, I must note that nearly 90% of all dwelling units are produced through, through the private sector investment. So this is a problem, I guess. And uh, that's why we see economy housing market relationship more directly in the Turkish case. So um, in 2019 and 2020, for the first time since the early 2000s, annual housing production was left behind the increase in the number of households. So this becomes a problem again. And considering the changing housing preferences of households, considering the increased demand for more space, and considering the declined output on the production side, uh, on the production side, you can assume that we have a uh, increasing house price figure in Turkish housing markets, and this trend is uh, is also the same for major cities in Turkey. Uh, so, um, as a result, I can say that. These high prices also uh, prevent households, uh, a large segment of the society, to access decent and affordable housing conditions. So we know that housing is an indispensable pillar for the well-being of society, but we also uh, know that housing outcomes are different for different income groups. Uh, it is households who have low income levels uh, who are experiencing problems in terms of occupation density, in, in terms of dwelling space availability. Uh, we see that uh, pandemic limited overall mobility, but those with more opportunities were able to change their housing and their location. So mobility uh, is mainly reserved for households having relatively high incomes in Turkey. Uh, so housing expenditures uh, compared to household budgets are high almost for almost all households, but it is again households in the lowest and low income quintiles who felt that cost burden more. Uh, considering all these uh, issues, let me say, it is clear that public policy and urban planning should search for the ways to improve housing and living conditions of the households who live in poverty, who have low income levels. Of course, at this stage, it is not possible to uh, recommend uh, very detailed uh, topics, but I can say that very generally, adequate standard of living for all households should be ensured, and there must be some specific measures and programs for the poor and low-income households. Uh, one of the options should be rental housing. We should not neglect uh, the rental housing option. We should not always support or encourage home ownership as the governments do. Uh, also, improved access to housing resources 
are important for all segments of the society. Uh, no action in these areas means housing-based inequalities will continue to deepen in the future in the coming decades and will continue to polarize our societies. Thank you very much for your attention. Evet, biz de çok teşekkür ederiz. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Let's move on with Matt, and then we're going to have the Q&A. Thank you very much, Erwin, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, really interesting to listen to all of your presentations. Uh, I thought I wanted to, um, to sort of take a step outside of the household. We talked a lot about what COVID-19 has meant to the home uh, and I wanted to see what sort of impacts it's had on the neighborhood. So what happens when we open the door from our house and step onto the street. Um, and at the same time, I wanted to sort of take out the crystal ball and uh, look a little bit into the future, what, how we think uh, the neighborhood might look in the coming decades. Um, and even be so bold as to say, uh, sort of how could the neighborhood be the level where we save the world. Uh, I won't be presenting any projects. I'm, I'm more sort of brainstorming together with you. So I'm, I'm hoping you'll, you'll join me for some discussion uh, after this. Um, I, I wanted to start with a, a sort of bold, but still re very sad <laughs> statement that the way that we're living right now is killing the planet. Um, I think we need to be reminded of that all the time. Uh, the way that we're living right now is, is killing the climate, it's killing biodiversity. It's, it's an unsustainable life that we have on this planet. Um, and since the majority of the people on the planet now live in cities, we could also say the way that we're living in cities is killing the planet. So that needs to be our entry point. Uh, we need to stop killing the planet somehow. Um, so I'm based in Sweden, uh, Stockholm and, and Swedish cities often come up as sort of high ranking on, um, on sustainable city indices. Uh, we're, we're known for having clean and green cities with good quality of life. Um, that is on the one hand true, uh, but on the other hand, it's partly because we've been very effective in exporting our environmental problems to other countries. Uh, so while we worked a lot with environmental sustainability in our cities, the impact of our activities are being seen elsewhere. Um, so who pays the environmental costs of the phones that we use, uh, the electric vehicles that we've started switching to, um, the clothes that we buy and use five times and then buy new clothes. Uh, a, a lot of the environmental problems that we are creating, uh, the burden for those are being felt elsewhere. Uh, and for that reason, I think we can't really talk about sustainability of cities without also talking about the lifestyles of the people who live in those cities and the consumption of those people. We need to look at the whole picture of, uh, of the impact our activities are creating. Um, and that's problematic, of course, because so much of our identity uh, as people living in cities revolves around consumption. Uh, we work in cities, we make money, we go out and buy new clothes, a new cell phone, a new makeup. Uh, the whole identity and sort of reason why cities are there tend to be a lot around shopping um, and consumption of things which are unsustainable in the long term. Uh, so, what what do we do if we try to change this? What are our what will our cities be if they're not focused around shopping? Uh, there are a couple of trends that are already beginning to shape this. Uh, one is an extremely um, ugly trend of this moving retail shopping out to external shopping centers. This is a very strong trend in Sweden that we're moving uh, 
uh, shopping so that people would go by car into these big complexes with huge warehouses where you do your shopping. Um, and that started creating holes in our city fabric, uh, especially in small and medium sized cities. It's very difficult for small shops to compete with these multinational companies that are located just outside the city boundaries. Uh, so we started seeing this trend where um, the suburban centers or the city centers are having difficulties renting out their space. Uh, they can't compete with the big ones. Um, and already before COVID, but especially during COVID, we've seen this trend towards e-shopping, online shopping, uh, where actually we don't have to leave our homes even, we can get everything delivered to us. Um, so what becomes the role of the city or even these external shopping centers if we're not doing our shopping there? Uh, the other thing we do in cities is work. Uh, and during the COVID pandemic, we realized that also working can be done from home. We don't actually have to travel into the city and be stuck in a traffic queue for an hour or stuck in a very uh, congested uh, public transport. We can do a lot of our working from home. We've also seen more and more evidence that after a certain level, shopping isn't really making us happy. Uh, and for a long time, we've built the idea of uh, progress around shopping. Uh, that, that is how you are, are a sort of um, a successful individual is by shopping. But more and more people are questioning whether we really want to do all this shopping and whether that actually makes us happy. And maybe there are other values in life that we feel are more important than filling our bags with goods. Um, and in the Swedish society, we're talking a lot about loneliness uh, and involuntary loneliness. Um, the fact that we're all together in the city, but at the same time in a very individual society, quite alone. Um, so I think we might be realizing that um, the cities that we want in the future should be based on a different type of consumption and more um, sort of interaction between people, focusing on other core values that we think will make us happy. Um, and that brings us back, I think, to the neighborhood level. Um, I think post COVID and in the climate era, uh, the neighborhood level and the things that we see, you know, within the 15 minute city that we're often talking about, just within sort of walking distance from our home, uh, the types of things that we have there will become much more important. Uh, and we would expect much more to happen at the neighborhood level. Um, so that might be, and th that has lots of implications for how we plan cities. Um, one thing is this trend of, of moving away from planning the streets for cars. Uh, if we're thinking that in the future, we're not going to need transport in the same way, the old industrial sort of everybody moves from their housing areas to the factory or to the central business district will not be the same anymore. Uh, we will want to use the street level in a different way. Uh, and there, I think these investments in micro mobility, um, reclaiming the streets for pedestrians, for cyclists, for e-scooters, for children, for people who want to walk, uh, work very slowly, um, for people who want to just sit and talk. Um, I think reprogramming, reprogramming the street to become part of our living rooms rather than transport infrastructure. Uh, that will be a major change to the neighborhood. Um, the other thing is the, the notion that we have one thing which has one use. Uh, we have a home where we sleep. Uh, we have a working place where we work. We have a shopping center where we shop. That notion that one thing has one use, that's going to start getting more and more questions. And we're going to see um, a lot more flexibility in uses. One thing does several things at the same time or at different times during the day. Um, so um, this picture illustrates that a bus stop could actually also be a, a swing. Uh, but of course, it has lots of other implications on 
on workplaces, for example, how do you use those? What's the school when, uh, when nobody's going to school there during the evenings? Can it be used for other activities? How can we optimize resources by thinking of them as being, being possible to use for multiple things? Uh, it's also very likely that the, the online shopping trend is going to continue. Uh, and I'm very happy to buy my laundry detergent and my toilet paper online and not have to go to the to the store to pick them up. Uh, so that's that's likely to continue. But I think there's a lot of other goods uh, where we do want to to sort of um, feel the carrots or knock on the melons. And uh, so certain types of produce we do want to buy with our own hands and not through the laptop. Um, and we do enjoy this relationship with the people who produced it, the farmers. Uh, so I, I would see the neighborhood becoming the level where uh, the rural areas and the production of food and goods comes back into our life at a much closer level. Uh, so the re-emergence of wet markets, which we don't have so much in Sweden anymore. Um, I think also this idea that somebody's producing things and then we consume it and throw it away uh, is becoming more and more questioned. Uh, so the idea of of cyclic flows um, of so of course um, reusing and recycling the products that we buy, uh, but also upcycling uh, and co-producing uh, goods. Um, I think we'll realize that we. We enjoy drinking coffee in a mug that we created ourselves from clay, uh, or that it's actually quite fun to fix your vacuum cleaner uh, together with some friends in a workshop somewhere. Um, I think we, not because we have to, but because we want to, we want to be more active in producing and co-producing the types of products that we surround ourselves with. Um, I know there's five minutes left, Erwin. <laughs> I'm on track. Uh, and, and we're seeing the trends of this in a lot of areas of microbreweries for beer. Uh, people are baking their own bread. This whole reemergence of creating your own things because it gives you satisfaction. Um, I think that's going to be a, a strong trend. Um, and finally, doing things together uh, instead of sitting at home in your flat watching Netflix. Uh, you actually want to reconnect with people around you um, to enjoy uh, arts and crafts and culture and hobbies, both as a spectator, but also as a participator. Um, and to bring back um, like organic life into the city. This is an image from a, uh, an urban gardening project in Stockholm. Um, so there's all these new types of things that I think we will be wanting from the neighborhood, uh, which puts completely new demands on how we plan things uh, and which changes, will have to change the way that the neighborhood looks. Um, and getting people back onto the street, all kinds of people, uh, breaking that isolation uh, and trying to consider what is social infrastructure. We know all this infrastructure that's needed for cars or water or waste management, but if you want to facilitate a living room for old people in the neighborhood, you know, what does that look like? How do you build that infrastructure? Um, so that has a lot of implications for policy, of course. Uh, and I think, um, the first thing is that we, we have to sort of rethink who it is that will make these changes. Uh, we're quite used to it being the local government planning department who decides how things will look in maps and policies and plans, and then that happens. Uh, but this new way of looking at the neighborhood has a much broader base of stakeholders that would be part of creating it. Um, so if I start with, with the middle uh, bullet here, increasing the ease of entry. Um, 
I think that so these solutions are not going to come from the top and they're probably not going to come from the, the stakeholders that are currently in power um, in the city. But it's very difficult with the way that the planning system looks today for me as a resident in my neighborhood to do anything uh, because the ease of entry is very, oh, the, the, the possibility for me to enter and become an urban development stakeholder are very, very high. Uh, even though I wanted to, um, there's so many obstacles for me to come in and contribute. So I think we need to, we need to open up the possibilities in the neighborhood so that more stakeholders can contribute. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, how we do that. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to discuss that with you. Um, I think we also need to go beyond uh, mixed use planning. We had sort of function separation for a long time and we started saying, let's have many things at the same place, but I think we need to have sort of multiple use planning. It's, it's a house during nighttime. It's my office during the day. It's maybe a restaurant in the evening. Uh, how do we sort of use the same thing for multiple uses at the same time? Um, facilitating micro mobility, finding the business models for this new type of consumption that's based on other values. Uh, it's very easy to say that we want it, uh, but they tend to stay as pilot projects if we don't find the right business models to actually make them happen. Um, investing in, in social and community infrastructure um, whatever that means. And finally, moving closer to the ground. Uh, I think there's still a quite a distance between uh, the local government head office and the neighborhood level. So how do we, how do we close that gap a bit? Um, yes, thank you very much. Please, the shaker there is much. Uh, we thank you, Mats, and the main theme of Mats is very suitable uh, for our session, and uh, we are finishing our session with it. I think Robin is not with us currently, right? Uh, do I? Or right, I am almost happy right now, but we have talked about a lot of uh, important issues, and of course, there are a lot to talk about, and we have about uh, almost 20 minutes for Q&A. Maruf's uh, Think Again theme has been very suitable for us, and rethinking the household and having newer and better sustainable uh, design solutions is one of the important topics for us, and also thinking beyond the household, thinking about the neighborhoods, the streets, and also thinking about the other people outside of our systems is very important. Mm -hmm. And thinking about a new life, imagining a new life for everybody is uh, the way that we can uh, solve these crises. And first of all, I would like to ask to audience if there are any questions. I would like to, if uh, I can see them on the chat. Other than that, I would propose that we imagine that we are among each other and we are face to face as if we are around the table. I would like to also to say that you can ask each other questions as well and of course uh, if uh, somebody is asked a question others can also chime in and answer as well be free to share your opinions please and a friend of mine uh, messaged me in whatsapp and for the while talking about the solutions uh, he was saying that uh, they are connecting uh, Mats is connecting to us from Mars I was also thinking uh, the same thing in an imaginary planet uh, from a book that I've uh, read about 20 years ago the, the on that planet they didn't have kitchens for example in that book and
I mean privacy. I mean the household was only for privacy in that uh, work, and you that would allow you to make love with your uh, lover or be alone. But you wouldn't cook in that area because cooking was a public uh, action, and they. Uh, transition cooking into a public uh, service and when we think about these contexts and um, terms that are belonging to homes for example kitchen and cooking is something that we think in the context of uh, homes but it can be public as well but I mean let's uh, start with this question there are some functions of home if we were to remove these and transition them to another uh, space, can we imagine a different, can we realize a different Im uh, imagination for living through these ideas? Yeah, thanks. Uh, if, if I could start. Um, so just imagine that we moved uh, the living room away from the home and into the building. Um, at least in Sweden, we don't have that at all. You, you, have a, you have an apartment house with 100 apartments. Everyone has their own kitchen, bedroom, living room. Um, what if you created a, a living room for the people who live in that building? How would that work and what would it look like? Um, and would we even want it? Or are we happy to have our own living rooms? Yeah, already. I think I can react to that. Um, I've been reading up a lot in, in the project. Um, since to cut, cut the costs, we tried to focus on living on small surface. And um, we did these exercises with the end users where you would uh, give them small uh, plates with icons and ask what you want in your own house and what you want to share. And um, for example, you can have a small table in your own house, but then a big table where you can eat all together or invite your family and eat together with them. That would be in a collective space so that your own house can be smaller. And this is something that people have to get used to, as you say. But for this, especially as I just speak for my experience, for this target group, it is um, hugely important to have this kind of things to share because they are often, as I said, lacking a social network. And so to have these also physical opportunities to meet others, to rebuild connections, we believe and we see it's only eight people we're working with. But for these people, we see that rebuilding the social network really helps them to get back a grip on their life. It's so much different than to put someone from a houseless shelter into an apartment on their own than to put them in a living community where solidarity is key. And also in the space, the physical space allows this solidarity. Um, on the other hand, what we also noticed, and that has to do also a lot with your uh, final um, uh, recommendations, is that um, for the housing that we designed to be recognized and um, officially a house for people to get an allowance, uh, to get an address, everything like the administrative things, they all needed to have a separate small kitchen and, and bathroom. We couldn't have houses without those because they wouldn't be recognized in the law as a house and that would have implications for this already vulnerable target group that we don't want to put them in this gray zone. So that's like, as you say, we need to adapt our frameworks to make this more possible. Thank you very much, Aurelie. And without forgetting, I also like to ask if anybody has questions for Aurelie or if anybody wants to add something. Um, my question for Aurelie is, yes, uh, it is hard to change what we are used to, but I want to really want to know what are your experiences in your project about this subject and also during your presentation, the fact that these things are temporary, so and the people are uh, want to prefer maybe uh, aim to move on to a more permanent solution, or uh, is that is that uh, ha does that have any impact on the fact that they cannot uh, re uh, readjust themselves to new ways of living and the fact that they're expecting to transition into a permanent uh, household situation. 
question. So um, what we've learned is that at first, so there's a big difference between someone choosing to live in a tiny house because they believe they want to reduce their imp, uh, ecological footprint or whatever, uh, or these people who are forced to do so because they don't have money, they're in a shelter and we're offering this solution and we're saying it's a small scale house and whatever. We saw that um, by really from the start, explaining that to them, why is it small scale? The budget is small. We're still going to make qualitative housing. Um, so, and taking them along in this process of exploring together what is feasible, what can they do, what can they not? So that's one thing to take them along, inform them to talk about what, what can they do, what do they want to do and, and what is impossible for them to do. And then also, as you saw in some pictures, we visited, for example, a tiny house before we started our construction and design. We went to look, I put this toilet in, it's, a, it's not a nice picture, but it was a major thing to see. It's a dry toilet we're using. Um, so to see what it is, does it smell, how do you use it? We took them along and went to um, see that before implementing it. And um, so they still have to move to the houses. So we'll see how it uh, works out. It's a very important part to document and continue the research at that point. Um, unfortunately, the project is very delayed due to all these um, uh, problems with uh, legal aspects we had to find out. And then the COVID crisis, of course, delayed our construction and, um, and inhibited it, us to make neighborhood activities on the terrain. So because of all that, we're delayed. But um, that indeed makes them um, ha having to wait in some kind of limbo, not yet in the house, in the project for so long, not yet in their house. So some of them indeed do feel like we're we're stalling, but it's not because of the project. So let me explain also what the model is. Um, the idea is that they would move, they, they start with the project, they move um, in the house. And when the project has to move to a different south, site, they're allowed to move with us. And some people will probably want to stay longer and like to live in this more mobile way and, and enjoy to live in a community. But no one is um, asked to stay at any point. So there are also um, some people already left because they found a job um, partly, I think, I believe, thanks to the project and got uh, their life back on track. And then they wanted their own apartment and we don't ask them to stay if they don't want to. So there's going to be this fluctuation. And one very important thing, what we also want to achieve through making these connections with the neighborhood and neighborhood networks is we hope that these people, um, after living temporary in the neighborhood and when the project has to move out, that they at least get the opportunity if they want to stay and um, continue to live in this network they rebuilt and find maybe a house on the future site on the project that's going to be built. So we're also trying to work with, for example, CLT, the Community Land Trust, um, to use temporary their terrains and have our inhabitants to join the future project. Or if it's social housing, now they cannot be on the top of the priority list, but maybe we can argue for these people are already living there. Can, um, as houseless, maybe can they have some kind of priority to at least in the future be integrated in the in the neighborhood or on the site? So that's also, we, the project still has to be developed further. We have to test and, and negotiate with all parties for that. Yes, maybe uh, this is one of the things that uh, you talked about that should be discussed. Maybe the temporary, the fact that it is temporary, um, maybe uh, might be able to create a a fixed uh, mindset change and maybe we can build upon that now for Aureli and Daria there was a common area in uh, Aureli's solutions they had uh, two uh, s smaller private uh, areas and then common areas so that area also uh, makes people leave their private areas and also makes the transition from the individual to the society. So maybe Aureli would like to say something about that. And also I would like to ask Daria, these uh, kind of things for common areas, for example, did your students also uh, make similar solutions with your in your projects? Have you seen more individualistic designs or f for example uh, are there any designs that were incorporating the social areas in your designs or was it all individualistic and also quickly get to Khan has questions in this context I would also like to voice them but everybody can answer these questions of course 
First one is uh, how can we integrate nature in our households and also for reaching uh, solidarity and healthy uh, society, how can we improve our households? Let's start with Aureli and if anybody else want to add something, I can, uh, everybody else can also share their opinions. Now, in our project, it is mostly about interior design. All right. It, we are focused on interior uh, spaces. So for neighborhood communication, what we saw was the participants were uh, divided 50-50. 50% said that we are closed in and we will continue to be closed in and other 50% were saying that we are tired of our house we have to go out and we have to be out and the participants who said that they would like to go out they also said their relationship with their homes have changed they, they are saying that they wouldn't use their homes as much uh, in the past but their home usage has increased uh, white color people uh, with the upper middle class has uh, been changed a lot uh, who have the fact that the, the amount of time that they use their houses uh, are experiencing changes the most and for the neighborhood relations this has been impacted very positively this is one of the things that we didn't see coming you know if they are not experiencing an auditory problem they started having coffees with their neighbors uh, who have been living in the same building for seven years for example but they have never met before they would just say good morning and in the pandemic they would ask each other if you are sick how are you are you well and they would start having coffees together spending time together in a serious manner the neighborhoods get uh, started to get to know each other and this was an unexpected outcome of the pandemic if they are not having any problems about uh, sound it was always positive for the neighborhoods so socializing actually has increased with the covid yes uh, this is uh, definitely the case for neighbors all right there's I would also like to remind the question from our audience how can we integrate the nature and what is natural in our households I mean for the nature I mean if you were to take a look at Turkey what we uh, usually recommend is having the roofs the how can we prevent the rainwater uh, being lost uh, that is falling on the roofs but I think I think we will go forward with uh, more greener designs on the interior design as well. The uh, interior our relationship I have lost connection I cannot hear the speakers because I have lost connection. Yapabiliriz. Durumu bence söz konusu olacak ki bunu kendi tecrübelerinden de biliyorum. Hani çevrede ya çatı çatı katında yani en üst katta oturan e, nereden böyle işte Çatıya bir çatı penceresi açabilir miyiz? Bu çatıdan işte teras kısmı çıkartabilir miyiz? Gibi böyle. Can we create some uh, roof windows, for example, and uh, some personal uh, questions about having greener roofs were also uh, a question we received a lot. And I think the end users will have more control over the no if there isn't anything else uh, anybody is going to say yes the housing situation is of course 
very much important for pandemic but if you were to talk about turkey specifically household is these days we are uh, not talking about covid as much but we are still talking about rent uh, prices and you don't even have to take a look at the news we all experience this and we know students who are not able to find homes an apartment there are not any spaces for uh, students to live this is being experienced all around turkey and your research is also showing the reasons for these as well and i would also like to ask of course rent pricing is a problem as well and how much of is is structural how much of it is rooted from the pandemic do you think and to be able to face COVID better, how, what, what kind of policies can be made? What I can say is, of course, this is a very wide question. This is question. This is hard to answer in a short amount of time. But what I can say is, the problem we have today in Turkey is, of course, COVID increased demand uh, in a short time, in a short amount of time. But uh, the problem in uh, in its root is a structural problem. It is not because of the COVID. And uh, you know there is a saying that you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. But in Turkey, the decision makers is putting all their eggs in one basket. And the, that uh, basket, that solution is home ownership. If you entirely focusing on home ownership and if you do not have some solutions for renting for uh, the space uh, usage policies that is the problem you will have the private sector has about more than 90 percent of the household uh, project and the 10 percent that is the social housing that is made by the government is also focusing on home ownership so renting is not thought about at all if you want to have a more just uh, market we have to have more options first of all the ownership we have to increase the rented apartment stock and we have to have some initiatives to keep the number of renting uh, available if you leave everything to the private sector you will take a look at the houses that are created there are 90 percent uh, three or four rooms in the rooms but one person two person households have increased now the home stock house stock apartment stock is not able to uh, be enough at this point because <clears throat> household house ownership is of course uh, having less responsibility on the government but we have to have some advancements in uh, this industry and otherwise we are not going to have any solutions especially for land policies if we were to do these uh, revolutions i i think we can maybe hope to reach a just uh, housing environment there is i think one more question but i'm going to unfortunately skip that after that i hopefully will be uh, signing them in writing maybe they can uh, email you for an answer i would like to thank you all for listening to us and keep following the uh, sessions 